Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, please, please introduce yourself. Let us know who you are in the chat box. No. Okay. Well, you know what? Right now, this call, the Zoom came in. Call me tonight, okay? Okay. Hey, Marquise. This is Liz. Hey, Liz. How you doing? Good morning. Welcome. I'm excited to see you this morning. I know. We haven't chat in a while. What's going on? You know what? I'm going to blame it on coronavirus. Uh-uh. You don't blame nothing on Rona. <laughs> Rona don't stop us. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Please let us know where you're from. Say your name and where you're from in the chat box. Uh, also, use this time to say hello to all the people you haven't seen in so long uh, from when we were in person. Um, this is an opportunity to say hello and catch up with some folks. Hello, everybody. Liz here, Central Harlem. Hi. Hi, Liz. Hi, everyone. It's Bailey from Fredericksburg, Virginia. <laughs> Bailey! It's really good to see you, Bailey. Yes, yes. Hey, how you doing? Nina, I see you. Let me give you a big <laughs> hug. Hi. I've been walking to the heights. <laughs> hey, I see you. <laughs> How are you? Hi, this is Regina from the Titan Valley. That red building in the back is a Michelama. That's where I live. The view is from Fort Tryon Park. Oh, oh nice. Upper Manhattan is representing. Go ahead. <laughs> oh wow welcome welcome we have so many people joining us today please if you're just joining say yeah. your name in the chat box all right uh, let us know where you're from how to get by all right check in question today i am curious to know what you all think about the city's plans to reopen uh that will be part of the conversation that we have today uh so go ahead and type your response into the chat box and let us know what you think about the city's plans uh have you read it have you had a chance to review it Oh, wow. Welcome, Brian and Grace from Harlem. I can't. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, that's Virginia. Hello. Virginia. It's Bailey. How are you doing? Fine. I'm glad to see you, even yes. like this. <laughs> that's <laughs> terrific. I've been having oh, wow. There are 101 of you amazing. What's up, Lois? folks on the line. Welcome. Welcome. Please, uh, if you are just joining us, let us know who you are in the chat box. Uh, where are you from? Uh, the check-in question today is, what do you think about the city's plan to reopen? Have you had a chance to review it? Welcome. This is also a time to say hello uh, to some familiar faces, people uh, we haven't seen since we were together in person. So use this time to catch up with folks. <laughs> yeah. 
I love it. I love it. I love seeing everybody out here. Lady Liz, I see you. I hope that uh, we have a little discussion on uh, the protests and what we can do to mitigate the possible uh, reinfections of everybody uh, creating new spikes in the city. Yeah, I think that is definitely a topic we can touch on. Um, we will be touching on policing um, in New York City, especially as we're talking about the city's plan to reopen. Um, what role will police officers be playing as the city reopen? Will they be enforcing versus encouraging people to practice social distancing? Um, yeah, we'll get to have all of those, uh, ask all of those questions and have that conversation. Um, so thank you for raising it. Uh, others, how are you doing? If you're just joining us, please put your name in the chat box. Let us know where you're from. Uh, the check-in question today is, how do you feel about the city reopening? Have you had a to review the plan? They brought up about police encourage social distancing. Um, the other day I was at Lighthouse, the fish place here in Harlem. Um, very, very popular. And of course, the door they were encouraging people to pass. But then it was <laughs> I'm sorry, you froze on us. Um, but I'm going to go ahead. It is now uh, 10 10, so I'm going to get us started into the program. Uh, we have 105 uh, WEAC folks uh, participating with us today. I am so excited to be uh, with you all today. And as I mentioned, I'm going to go ahead and get us uh, started. So I am pulling up my uh, slide presentation that I shared this morning. This is Charles, Jane. How are you? Hello, Charles. All right, we're going to talk more about the um, house rules, but I would ask you now, if you are able to, uh, to put your phones, um, computers, or video uh, mics on mute. So I want to start um, today by acknowledging um, that it is Pride Month and wishing everyone um, and all of our allies and all of our family members a happy Pride Month. 1969, uh, that one of the more popular um, hangout spots, the Stonewall, was raided by NYPD. I bring this up not only because it is Pride Month, but I bring this up um, because of what we are seeing on the streets today. We are seeing an outcry. We are hearing people call for change in the way that policing is done, in the way that we keep our communities safe. Okay, just get me. And the struggle and the fight that took place following that raid at Stone Wall is reflective of the battles that we are having today. You see, the overlapping thing is the way this city, the way the state uses police to enforce the rules and regulations that in many instances disproportionately harms poor people and people of color. Today, we are going to have a very tough conversation. Today, we are going to talk about moving forward. Today, we are going to talk about how we can be in solidarity with the thousands of individuals, the hundreds of thousands of individuals who are marching, not only in Northern Manhattan and New York City, in this country and all of the states that we have in the United States and 11 countries across the world are all marching, calling for police reform because we have seen yet another video. 
Another video that brings me to my core. As we all sat and watched a young man be choked to death by a knee. A police officer who didn't even flinch as all the cameras were pointing in his direction. Sending a message that he was okay. That he would not be held accountable for his actions. That the other officers involved would not be held accountable for their actions. George Floyd has fought yet another uprising in this country and throughout this world. And so today, I am asking, before we start this program, for a moment of silence. I want to ask for a moment of silence for Eric Gardner. I want to ask for a moment of silence for Ahmed Aubrey. I want to ask for a moment of silence for Piana Taylor. I want to ask for a moment of silence for George Floyd. I want to ask for a moment of silence for all the individuals who were killed during police encounters who names were not mentioned, who didn't fit the high profile. All of those individuals, all of those Black lives matter. So I ask you again to join me for 30 seconds in a moment of silence.
don't have any sound. Does that everyone have sound? I have sound. Oh, I have a, sound. We're in, a, we're in a moment of silence, or is Marquise yeah. not there yet? He's frozen. He's frozen. Yeah. So, um, let's. I'm no getting it. All right. Um. All right, so let's move forward. Uh, I think I have the presentation. Oh, he has a presentation. Uh, he's going to come back in one second. Uh, your host is, yeah, just give me a second and we'll be right, we'll resume, okay, everyone? Uh, we have a little small te uh, technical difficulty. Charles, why don't you review the agenda in the meantime? Yes, I will do that. Yeah, he has a, okay. Um, Did we lose? Yeah, we didn't lose me. Um, Hey, Cecil. Hey. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it's okay. going to be a powerful one. Does everyone see my, my, my screen? Not quite yet. OK, let me just get it up. Hello. We see that it's on its way. OK. Let's see what's going on. Uh, okay, let's do it again. And there it is. There you go. Is I it got on? It. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. See you. All right, just let me move this other piece <laughs> out of the way. And I can actually look at it. Cecil, maybe we can take this uh, moment just to remind those who are not members to uh, become a member. Uh, why don't you go ahead and do that? I just did. Yay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lewis. When are the membership meetings, Lewis? I'm sorry? When are the membership meetings? And how much are due? Uh, dues are, uh, you know, I forgot, 35 bucks a, a year. You can. 25. Oh, 25. 25, okay. Uh, a bargain, even more. You can pay it off in installments if you don't have the full uh, uh, price on it. And uh, the uh, people who run the organization will be very glad to accommodate any of you if it's needed. And our membership meetings are on the second Saturday of every month. Um, that's why we're meeting today. We really want to encourage people to join us and become members. Uh, the issue is the change doesn't happen uh, only with one person. We need all of us together pulling in the same direction and working hard to change the policies and to end things like systemic racism in our country. So join us, uh, we'll be happy to do that. Happy to have you on board with us. Uh, Charles, can you get to the slide where it says the actual agenda? Yeah, I do. Or no. I, know what, I do. I, is, it, is it not up? You don't see it? Let me just share it again. It's showing the Q&A. Can, can we see it now? Yes. Now it's there. Thank you. Yeah. OK, not a problem. So uh, well, every, I don't wanna, see it. You go ahead, Tom. OK, the agenda. Welcome, which we have done. Uh, review of New York City's opening plan, uh, panel discussion. NYC's opening plan, panel discussion on policies in New York City, and then we'll be closing. Policing in New York City. Policing in New York City, I apologize. Um, rules. All rules apply here that apply during our in-person membership meeting. So guys, just be aware that we are, there's a lot of people on the meeting. Um, if you want to ask questions, you can put it in the chat box and uh, we will respond to the chat box with questions. And for those um, that are on call, the link to become a member is in the chat box. So if anybody uh, checks the chat box, the link is there. So I just want to make sure you guys all, uh, you may not be able to hear yourself talk because I'll put all the mics on mute. Um, like I said, once again, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat box and we'll respond to the chat box. Okay. Um, 
there's virtual. Uh, there are a couple of ways you can um, participate in the meeting. Um, you have the gallery view and the speaker view. You have a choice of what you want to take place. So make sure you accommodate yourself to how you want to view the meeting. Um, we do have a, a place where you can raise your hand um, on the uh, on the bottom or uh, in a on a bar where it tells you how to animate and pause and share screen and participants. So um, if you do not know what that is, it's it could be anywhere in your in your process of how you set up your screen. So just be aware that if you want to raise your hand, there's a place that you can, and you got to kind of go find it within the preview of your screen. Charles, generally they're in the participants uh, icon at the bottom. Okay. The uh, thank you very much. Um, I saw it, but everyone has, yeah, that's where they are. Correct. Thank, thank you, Charles, for stepping thank over. And I apologize to uh, all of you. I had a little bit of a glitch. But I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I think, Brittany, if you're ready, we could uh, kick it over to you. I'm taking mine out. Stop sharing. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I got to put everybody in. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Brittany. So I'm going to be presenting on our plan for reopening New York moving New York forward. As you know, we began reopening this past Monday, June 8th with phase one and in phase one, the industries that will be reopening are construction, agriculture, forestry, fishing and hunting retail, which is limited to curbside pickup or in store pickup and drop off manufacturing and wholesale trade, um, which is paper or paper manufacturing, wholesalers, things of that nature. Next slide. Marquis. And the second phase industries, there are businesses that will be required to remain closed, such as malls, and that's specifically and indoor or common portions of a retail mall that is more than 100,000 square feet. Indoor on-premises restaurants and bars, excluding takeout and delivery of off-premises food for consumption. Large gathering and event spaces, such as venues that host concerts or conferences, gyms, fitness centers, and exercise classes, video lottery and casino, gaming facilities, movie theaters with the exception of drive-ins. Places of public amusement, whether indoors or outdoors, and those would be places like amusement parks, zoos, or aquariums. And then for what will be reopening, next slide, Marquise. All office-based jobs will be reopening, so that's professional services, administrative support, information technology, retail, or excuse me, real estate services, so that's building and property management, leasing, rental, and sales services. Retail, and that's in-store shopping, rental, repair, and cleaning, barber shops, and hair salons with limited services, motor vehicle leasing, rental and sales, and then outdoor dining. And for phase three, we will be um, entering into the phase where indoor restaurants and food services will be reopening, and personal care will also be reopening, and that those are places such as nail salons and tattoo and piercing parlors. And the localities will have the um, discretion to open public pools and playgrounds at that time. So we also included links for each of these phases. If you want more information, there's a lot to look at on New York Forward. The governor has provided a lot. Thank you.
Thank you, Brittany, for walking us through the city's plans to reopen. Uh, this is a great way for us uh, to begin a conversation about what we think and um, is the city moving forward in the best way. And so we have a great panel of speakers who are going to engage us in that conversation. Uh, so I would like to introduce um, if you yes, this is Devin, yes. Yes, please yes. put your phones on mute. Um, and I'm asking my co-host folks, if you see a unmute phone to please mute them. Uh, I, I now like to introduce a uh, membership planning committee member, um, Anthony, to lead us into this conversation. Okay, uh, thank you, Marquise. So, hi, everybody. I'm Anthony. I'm a member of the WEAC Planning Committee. Um, and uh, I'm going to be moderating today's panel on the reopening of uh, New York City. Um, so, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and they will each have about two to five minutes to, to speak, each of them. So, the first one I'll introduce is uh, the Councilman Mark Levine. He is the District 7 uh, council member representing uh, West Harlem. Uh, he's been our council member since 2014. He's also the chair of the New York City Council Health Committee and also a member of the Progressive Caucus. We also have our second panelist, Laura Levine. She is a deputy bureau chief of the Consumer Frauds and Protection Bureau of Letitia James, Attorney General Letitia James, uh, New York State Office. She previously worked as a staff attorney at the Just Women's Justice Center at Pace University. And our third panelist, Dr. Jane Bedell, uh, she's a member of the New York City Health Department's COVID-19 Speakers Bureau. And she's also born and raised in the Bronx. Um, she's formerly the city's assistant commissioner and medical director of the Center for Health Equities Bronx Neighborhood Health Action Center. She's also known as uh, the Bronx's doctor. In 2018, she received the Sloan Public Service Award, <clears throat> which is the Nobel Prize for, of city government. Um, and with that, I will, let's start with Mark Levine to just give a first introduction and say a few words, followed by Ms. Laura Levine and then Dr. Jane Bedell. Councilman. Well, thank you so much, Anthony, and good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. Incredible that over 120 of you are taking time on this Saturday morning to focus on these important issues. And I just wanna thank WEAC for everything you do to put environmental justice and justice more broadly on the agenda of this city. Today, we're really confronting two pandemics, twin pandemics, the pandemic of police violence and the pandemic of coronavirus. Racism is the thread which links these two pandemics. It's driving the disproportionate murder of African Americans and people of color by police, but it has also driven the inequality of the coronavirus pandemic, which has resulted in fatality rates for black and brown New Yorkers that are double that of white New Yorkers. And look at a zip code by zip code comparison, it's even more stark. In communities like West Harlem, zip code 10031, or Southern Washington Heights, where I'm talking to you from today, 10032, or parts of Central Harlem like 10027. The fatality rate is five times or more what it is in wealthier zip codes in places like the Upper East Side. And if you look at outer borough neighborhoods like Far, Walk, Far Rockaways, Queens, East Elmhurst, Queens, the Northeast Bronx, you'll see fatality rates which are 10 times or more what they are in wealthier, whiter areas. This is a pandemic defined by inequality, inequality in access to healthcare, access to um, employment opportunities, safe housing opportunities. All of it is driving this inequality. And if nothing else comes out of this tragedy, we need to redouble our commitment now to focus on those inequalities, which have now been laid bare for the world to see. We have come a long way since the hellish days of March and April in this fight and the phase one reopening 
is a major marker in our progress. But make no mistake, this pandemic is not over. I know all of you and all of us are sick and tired of coronavirus. We're sick and tired of being locked in our homes. But the truth is, coronavirus is not done with us globally, nationally, or in New York. There are now 23 states around the country where the rates of coronavirus are increasing in about a dozen, which are starting to run out of hospital capacity. And here in New York, we're still getting 400 newly confirmed cases of coronavirus every single day in the five boroughs. I wanna repeat that. Just in the five boroughs, we are seeing about 400 new confirmed cases of coronavirus every single day. And they're going to be more that we don't know about because they haven't been tested. So this threat is real. And the threat of a rebound is real. And so Brittany laid out um, in very clear format the phases to come. There are really going to be four phases. But moving forward on those phases, it requires us to make progress in beating back the spread of this virus. If that doesn't happen, we can't move to the next phase. In fact, if we get a real rebound, we're going to have to grapple with a very difficult decision about whether even to roll back some of the prior reopenings. No one wants it to come to that. No one wants our city or our state to have to face that difficult decision on whether to roll back the hard earned reopenings that we're already enjoying right now. To avoid that, we have to do much better. We have to be much more consistent about things like wearing face masks, about washing our hands, about maintaining social distancing. I know you see it, I see it, I feel it. We have become less tight on face masks out in the public, I see it. We have become less obsessive about hand washing. Me personally, I'll own, I'll own up to it, but we can't let that happen. And the, the last thing I'll say is there is a piece of public health infrastructure that we have to build, that we need we act and you as leaders to help us build, which is contact tracing and isolating and quarantining. This is the way we can safely reopen. We need, to, we need to stop the chains of transmission by tracking this virus. So if you test positive now, or someone in your family tests positive now, you are going to get a call from a contact tracer. This is new in the last two weeks. And they're gonna ask you to describe the people you've been in touch with who may have been infected, family members in your household, co-workers who you have contact with, anyone who you have been for 10 minutes or more within six feet distance. It's so important that you as leaders in this community explain contact tracing to folks in the neighborhood so that when they get that call, they understand that privacy is protected, anonymity is protected. This is about protecting your family, your neighborhood, your community. It's important that you let people know if they get sick and they have people in their apartment, they have an option to isolate in a hotel paid for by the city, free with food and prescription provided to protect their family. It's important you communicate that if you have been exposed, you have to quarantine at home. And by quarantine, I don't mean stay home, but go out to the grocery store and picking up takeout in a restaurant. No, quarantining means you're home unless you have a medical emergency. Again, the city will help on that by providing food and prescription. We need to be ambassadors out there, public health ambassadors, letting people know about this opportunity to stop the spread of the virus so that we can move on to phase two and three and four reopening. So I'm gonna pause there because we have a great lineup of panelists that I'm excited to hear from, but I'm also here for any Q&A that you have. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias de nuevo. Thank you, Wea. Thank you, Council Member Mark Levine. Um, I want to open it up for a few words from uh, Laura Levine as well. Laura, are you? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to share this beautiful Saturday morning with you. I am an attorney with the uh, New York State Attorney General's Bureau of Consumer Fraud and Protection, which is one of the many bureaus that serves to guard the legal rights of people of the state of New York. 
and I'd just like to take a few minutes to provide some information about New York's price gouging law and then discuss the actions that Attorney General Fish James has taken to combat the scourge of price gouging in New York. Um, most of you likely have experienced this for yourselves in February or March, um, noticing a shortage of many essential supplies that people need during this crisis. And even if you could find the supply you needed, you might have been charged an exorbitant price. New York law prohibits charging exorbitant prices during periods of emergencies or disruptions of the market. So the statute has three elements and I'll briefly go through them. You cannot charge unconscionably excessive prices for essential goods and services during periods of an abnormal disruption of the marketplace. And that's a mouthful, so, so I'll break it down for you. What's an unconscionably excessive price? Um, there's no formula for this. So there's two ways that the statute provides for us to look at it. One is basically a before and after comparison. What did the product cost before? And is there gross disparity in the price after? And we have seen this in the consumer complaints filed with our office. So to give one or two examples, chicken drumsticks, a basic food item, somebody saw them, they used to be at their store for 69 cents a pound, and during the crisis, $19.99 a pound. That's a gross disparity in price. Don't need a statute to figure that one out. Single roll of toilet paper, $4. Again, that's a gross disparity in the price of toilet paper pre this pandemic. The second way to determine whether the price is excessive in a way that the statute covers is what are, what are similar stores in that neighborhood selling that item for? So for example, if one can of Lysol spray for $12 and down the block you can buy the same one for $5, that's likely a case of price gouging. But the price gouging statute does not apply to every product. It only applies to essential goods and services. And those are goods and services that are vital and necessary to the health, safety, and welfare of consumers and the public. And we've spent a lot of time at the Attorney General's office, you know, figuring out what items are covered and what items are not. So some of the items that are covered as essential include hand sanitizing products, disinfecting wipes, liquids, and sprays, rubbing alcohol, toilet paper and tissues, basic food supplies like milk and eggs. We get a lot of complaints about food. So for example, something like hamburger meat, we would say is an, you know, a basic food product. People are gonna complain to our office about you know, fancy T-bone steaks. That's not an essential food product. But we're also covering infant formula, diapers and baby food, and basic medication and supplies. So you're over the counter of the medications, thermometers, even pulse oximeters, which many um, doctors are recommending as a product to keep in your house in case you come down with COVID. What, one item that we're not covering is cloth, is face masks. The CDC does recommend obviously that everybody wears face masks and that's very important, but they can be cloth-based coverings that people make themselves. So we're not covering the surgical masks or the N95 respirator masks. But New York City is. New York City passed emergency regulations covering those items. So if our office receives complaints about face masks, we forward it to them and they can take care of that under their own regulations. And we're constantly looking at the list based on the complaints that come to our office to see if we need to add additional products. One thing that we learned is that this statute had some real limitations because it only applied to consumer goods and services, meaning things you'll use in your own household. But luckily, June 6th, the statute was amended to cover two of its real limitations. For example, it didn't originally cover if you were a medical professional and you needed to buy personal protection equipment, such as the medical grade masks. That wasn't covered. If you were an employer and you wanted to buy masks for your employees, that wasn't covered. As of June 6th, those items now are covered and we think those are really important protections now to have in place. As I said, the statute doesn't apply all the time. Typically, when there's not an emergency, a retailer can choose what price they want to sell their product for, and you can either buy it or not buy it. But when there is a disruption of the market, such as now, the price that gouging statute applies. Now here, the governor declared an emergency on March 7th, but the statute applied well before that. People could see that the market was disrupted well before March in terms of what products were available to them. 
And the statute also covers more than retailers. We've noticed in some of the investigations that we're doing, while the retailer price is very high, that's because the wholesaler is price gouging them. And so in those cases, we're taking a look at the wholesalers and the distributors as well, because they're also covered by the statute. So let me just tell you about a few of the things that the Attorney General's office is doing to combat price gouging during this pandemic. Our office has been very, very active. In the last few months, we've received more consumer complaints related to COVID than in our entire history of the office, as far as we've been tracking. Thousands and thousands of complaints have come in about price gouging, and we review every single one, and we have sent over 1,500 cease and desist letters to New York merchants across the state. And we continue to do so as the complaint comes in and we evaluate it, we will continue to send those cease and desists. We're also working online with platforms such as Amazon to remove listings of price gouge product that come to our attention. We have a good working relationship with many of the platforms. If a consumer reports something online, we reach out and we get that listing taken down. And we've also filed a lawsuit. Um, we filed a lawsuit and within the last few weeks against a New York-based distributor called Quality King that we allege price gouged Lysol disinfectant spray in its sale to retailers. And then those retailers passed those increased prices on to their consumers. So in this case, for example, between January 2020 and April 2020, Quality King increased the price of its spray from $4.25 for a 19-ounce can to as high as $9.15. $9.15 per can, which is really an outrageous price increase. And that was to the retailer. The retailers then passed it on and they charged the consumers as much as $16.99 for one can of Lysol that pre the pandemic would sell for roughly five to $8. And this is the kind of action that the attorney general is committed to stopping. Uh, the, this crisis is terrible in so many ways and to have merchants or retailers or wholesalers take advantage of what people and communities need during this time of crisis, it's outrageous. And we're working really hard to prevent it. Um, so I would encourage people, we have a very good resource on our website. Our website is ag for attorney general, dot ny for New York, dot gov. If you go on the homepage, there's a section on coronavirus information and warnings about consumer scams. And that's all kinds of consumer scams, not just price gouging. Laura, can, you put, that, can you put that in the chat? Um, that might be about my abilities, but I will certainly try. Okay. Uh, if I can't do it right now, I'll do it before the end of the call. I'll get my, my tech assistant, my daughter. She'll come down and help me. Okay. Um, but we do have a price gouging complaint form specifically on the website. And I encourage people, you know, we're as good as the information we get, and we really re rely on communities and consumers and community leaders to alert us to the problems in, that they see in their neighborhoods. So if you see that a store is price gouging essential items, please file a complaint with us and we will look into it. Great. Thank, you for, thank you for your time. I'll, I'll get that up on chat if I can, and I'm willing to answer any questions people have. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, and finally, we have Dr. Jane Bedell. Um, in the interest of time, if we could keep uh, the opening statements to, to as brief as possible. Thank you, Doctor. Very, very short because it's important to get to the questions. Uh, that's the most important thing, I think, in these more interactive uh, uh, exchanges here. Of course, there's tons of information. There's so much information that it's hard to grapple uh, with it, um, but I'm, I want to help guide people to information working with organizations like we act is a central activity of the New York City Department of Health because we understand that it's only through these kinds of um, partnerships that are authentic and real and meaningful that we're going to affect the kind of change that we want as your public health servants, which is what we are in the Department of Health in order to achieve what's our mission and I hope your mission uh, to promote and protect the health of all New Yorkers and the health department has a very specific um, health equity focus on all that we do. Um, so just to remind people where we are in the pandemic, we are still in the state of, uh, or the situation of what is called widespread community transmission. 
There's still a lot of transmission, but the important thing to remember, as I think the council member was talking about, is New Yorkers are not only flattening the curve, as everyone said a month ago, we are right now crushing the curve. We know enough right now today, and we know we know it because we're doing it, we know enough right now today to break the chain of transmission. It's all the things you all are doing and we have to stay focused on this or there will be most likely a resurgence. So most important, stay as separated as you can physically when you are in closer proximity, face coverings and frequent hand washing. That, that's, that's the key. That's gonna be the same no matter uh, you know, what happens going forward. We're gonna add little pieces of information to that. We are now moving in phase one to a time period where we have the ability, we have city workers and other partners that are gonna track down each positive case and find out who they've been in contact with and help all of those people appropriately separate themselves. And if we can do that well, then the people who are not positive cases and are not contacts can go about their business a little bit more freely. So that's what the contact tracing uh, is gonna do. I welcome questions on that. I'm gonna ask uh, Anna who's um, helping me and is on the chat to also put into the chat, we have specific guidelines somebody mentioned uh, about uh, best practices for protests. Uh, that's up on our website, I'll, I'll throw that in there. Uh, and then we can take questions about that, about contact tracing, about how we're gonna really hold on to the tremendous success that people said New York could not achieve, but we are achieving it uh, and how we're gonna drive it down even further. So let me stop right there and happy to take uh, any, any kinds of questions and so thankful for this forum. Thank you, doctor. Um... So essentially the format is, uh, I will ask uh, the panelists a couple of questions and if there's time, we'll open it up to a Q&A at the end where the membership can um, uh, put in questions in the chat. Um, so the first question I have is for council member Mark Levine. Um, as Brittany outlined uh, the, the reopening phases for New York, phase one, which opened this past um, Monday, June 8th, and is expected to open phase two, according to some news articles, sometime in July. Um, uh, and this would include office-based jobs, outdoor dining, in-store shopping, et cetera. However, New York City doesn't exist as a kind of isolated city. We exist within a larger New York metropolitan area. And New Jersey, uh, which is a major part of that metropolitan area, is expected to open for phase two on Monday, this Monday, June, June 15th and Connecticut is scheduled for June 20th. Are we coordinating with the, the larger metropolitan area and how can this possibly affect um, uh, our reopening phases? Great question, Anthony. And uh, I wanna add a couple more important sectors that would be part of phase two. One is barbershops and beauty salons. Uh, a lot of you like me are in need of a haircut. And also house, houses of worship are scheduled to be part of phase two, but only at 25% uh, of capacity. Um, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis restaurants, uh, there also would be real limits, um, probably 50% capacity and keeping tables six feet apart, in addition to outdoor and takeout, of course. Um, the timing of all of these phases, as I mentioned before, depends on our progress in beating back the virus. So when we talk about early July as an expected phase two reopening, uh, emphasize the word expected. Um, this is the kind of thing we need to evaluate day to day as health data comes back. It is really important that we have coordination from state to state and city to city because if one place opens and the others don't, then everyone's gonna swarm that area. Um, having said that, you know, each state, each region has different challenges. The virus has been more intense in New York City. And, um, and, and I think our leaders have been rightly more cautious in the reopening. Uh, so I, I support that cautious pace. But there, there is, I think, good communication 
particularly between statewide in New York and between New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. At Council member, you muted yourself or okay. Am I I'm back? I don't know where you lost me, but you're you're um, back, yeah. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. We do have coordination, but that doesn't mean New York can't move at its own pace. And I support the more cautious pace that we're taking here in the city. Thank you, council member. Um, Ms. If I can Ms. just Levine. add in, if it's okay, just a tiny sentence to say that the health departments sure. uh, already have a history of cooperation and people know this um, themselves from having watched in the news at least how we handled uh, Ebola. There are major airports, people come into Newark who live in New York, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, uh, and during the most recent measles outbreak, which by the way, the measles outbreak was an outbreak that was uh, eventually resolved via contact tracing. We have a long history of these things. And there mm -hmm. is cooperation. Of course, there could always be more and better cooperation. And that's something for people to call for, obviously, our citizenship doesn't end at the borders of New York City and we need our agencies, our city agencies and our elected officials to be able to do more on that level. But we do have a long history of working uh, jointly in the tri-state area. So I just wanted to add that in. Thank you, doctor. Um, I have a question for Ms. Levine. You mentioned price gouging and thank you for that detailed information. But there are other um, instances of uh, fraud. Can you speak more to um, frauds like uh, COVID vaccinations and advertisements for home test kits and things of this nature, and also donations to fake charities that are being set up? Yes, I mean, unfortunately, anytime there is a tragedy, uh, fraud follows. So we were prepared to look for the kinds of frauds that you've mentioned. There, there's, you know, you go on the internet, it is rife with phony testing and phony cures. You know, I saw, um, I think it was, you know, that it was a chiropractor could cure your COVID, dance therapy could cure your COVID, you know, silver pills could cure your COVID. Um, our healthcare bureau has been sending cease and desist letters and reaching out to a number of companies with, with false claims. And I, I encourage everybody to be very, very skeptical of anything online that says it's a test or a cure. You know, contact your doctor, contact the health department. You know, don't waste money on these kinds of things. And again, charities. Um, there are a lot of phony charities that will say they're donating money to victims of COVID. We have a lot of resources, like I said, on our website that talk to these issues. Um, you can research what is an a actual charity versus what isn't a charity. Charities have to be licensed in New York. They're overseen by our Charities Bureau. And you can sift out the reputable ones because we want people to give. We want people to give to charities that are gonna put the money where they say they are, but not get scammed you know, by the scammer. So I, I do encourage people to take a look at our resource page. There's a lot of information. I saw in the chat, um, there's a question from somebody about their rights as an employee, you know, in terms of when they have to go back to work. We also have information for employees on that web page as well. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Levine. Um, Dr. Jane uh, Burdell, um, I have a question regarding contact tracing. Um, contact tracing will be essential, contact tracers specifically, will be essential in forming very um, strong relationships with uh, their communities, especially in undocumented communities where trust um, could be easily lost if ever gained. Um, there are concerns that contact tracing job applications are too narrowly focused on professional public health credentials and might be potentially overlooking respected community members who could be essential in, in uh, contact tracing. Is that a concern you share and how are we addressing it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a lot of thought has been put into the criteria for uh, the staffing of the contact tracing team. And I would think of it as a team. It's not going to be one person doing this. There's going to be somebody who gets in touch with the person. Let's say I test positive. I'm going to get on my phone. It'll say test and trace. Or I think it'll say test plus trace. Please encourage people to answer those calls. I'm talking to a person 
they're going to assess my situation, ask me about my contacts, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and then uh, get the information, we hope, so that they can get in touch with my contacts. Um, so the criteria we had to weigh, um, uh, getting a workforce that's going to be able to quickly uh, move forward with this and uh, with the with a ability to, to, to implement something that I will tell you the contact tracers, the existing contact tracers who are amazing people in the Department of Health, they say that it takes about six months to a year to become an excellent contact tracer. But we don't have six months in a year, folks. We have zero time for this. We have yesterday's time. Uh, so we weighed that carefully. I'm, I'm curious, and if somebody wants to put it into the chat, what they think was a limiting factor. Essentially, with equivalent experience, uh, my understanding, I'll go back and read them, but, but I did read them very carefully uh, when they were crafted. Uh, somebody with a very minimal educational, the very minimal, you know, formal education requirements, if you have other experience, so you can't just be a 17 year old high school graduate who has not done anything. But if you graduated from high school, you've been working in, in a community group or you've been working on this issue or you have life experience that you can put forward. Um, those things will, are all actually things that we really want. We want people who uh, pick up the phone to talk to somebody who they feel they can trust. So. We feel like we've been very attentive to that. If people want to either get in touch with your group separately offline or put it in the chat, I'm happy to go further because we actually really tried to make the requirements um, not uh, completely dependent on formal education and things that you would normally or conventionally see in these kinds of jobs. They, are, they do not look like the requirements of yesterday. We are operating in a, in, a, in a very important moment. And I think we value exactly what the question values is that we're getting the right people to do this work. So if there's something specific that we can do differently, we're gonna have this contact tracing force um, in place for months. And of course, people will come, you know, come and go as workforces do. Uh, and we have a chance to change it. So, so we, could, we could take the input, I'm happy to take it and move it. That's part of my job here is to both um, respond to questions, but also very much to be in the listening mode and elevate those things. So I'm absolutely uh, want to do that. So if there's something further, you know, let's take this discussion out of this forum for the moment, uh, because we want what that question wants also. And Anthony, you know. I just dropped a link to the contact tracer job application. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and this is actually a question for both the doctor and I think the council member to chime in if he desires. Um, like you mentioned, it's not just the contact tracers, the whole ecosystem. Uh, contact tracers, investigators, and also care resource coordinators. So the question I have is regard to the care resource coordinators. Uh, many states have overlooked funding for this essential role. Uh, care resource coordinators, to remind everyone, provide access to resources and help solve problems like a need for food or medicine, et cetera. Um, does New York have enough care resource coordinators? Do you feel we've overlooked this role? So we understand that what's going to be vital if you're asking people to stay at home and be separated, uh, People are not going to be able to do that unless they have the resources that they need. Uh, the council has certainly been part of this and I anticipate council member that this again, we're going to learn as we do. I am sure we are going to make mistakes, but the intent very much is now to have a very robust uh, and quick way to connect people to the services that they need and to be nimble enough uh, to, to navigate that. So there, in addition to those roles that you mentioned, there will also be a role, a community engagement specialist. And that person's job is to scour around and, and, and talk with groups like yours and to find the resources that will connect well and effectively uh, and with the um, appropriate uh, 
cultural humility uh, and knowledge and language and all those things that make those connections not be like this, but really be uh, lock solid. So that's a very important um, part of what the effort uh, is going to be. And also just to mention that um, the health department already has started this work and it's really important for people to realize that what we do in an emergency is we build on what we already have, right? You, it's very hard to start something new. We had contact tracing in this city, robust contact tracing. Some think it's the best contact tracing uh, in the nation uh, in our health department. We are gonna build on that. Health and Hospitals is working with us to, to make the whole effort work. Uh, and similarly, uh, almost 20 years ago now, the health department put into Harlem, South Bronx and Central Brooklyn uh, offices whose job it is. So I was working in the Bronx office, but there's a Harlem office as well, the Bureau of uh, Neighborhood Health for Harlem. And our job is to make these kinds of connections and the health department for sure is building uh, on the community engage engagement work that's already there. And I just wanna say that another piece of this for planning forward is some people talk about, let's, we gotta get back to normal. We gotta get back to normal. Well, I think probably this group agrees and, and the health department certainly agrees. We don't wanna go back to that normal because that normal is what created the completely preventable, completely preventable and systematically designed uh, institutions and ways of doing business that created these mortality differences that the council member uh, already described. So we wanna think about how we're going to go forward differently and create a new normal and having the right infrastructure to build on the next time that there is a pandemic and there will be a next time uh, so that we've got stronger structures and more equitable structures. So I wanna throw that in because that's super important for groups to think about. Part of the forward planning is to get through this phase and that stage and this month and that, and also to say how we're gonna build um, for the future. So we, this community engagement, authentic partnerships, really being able to link well and build on what we already have, that's gotta be a part of our work uh, from this moment uh, going forward. So I just needed to add that in. Thank you for that. Uh, doctor, I'll get to some of the audience questions as well. Um, someone asks, how accurate are the COVID tests, particularly mm -hmm. antibody tests? Mar uh, council member, I, I know you uh, released a flyer addressing this. Could yes. you speak to this? Yeah, there are two kinds of tests. This is uh, really important to clarify. There's a test which can tell you if you have the virus. That's a diagnostic test. And then there's a test which tells you if you have the antibodies, which most of us would develop after we have recovered from the virus. And so folks who are in my position who had the virus but weren't able to get a test at the time might want to know. And so I did go get an antibody test and it came back positive. The reason I did it, and I think the best reason to do this, is because I want to donate my plasma to people who are still fighting this virus in the hospitals. I'm actually scheduled to donate uh, Monday and uh, watch social media for that. Um, but you have to be cautious about this test because <clears throat> one, there can be a lot of false positives. Um, and two, we don't really understand how immunity works. We hope that if you have the antibodies that you have some measure of immunity for some period of time, but we don't yet know that for sure. So you cannot, use a positive antibody test to let your guard down. You still have to wear a face covering. You still have to wash your hands. You still have to do social distancing. An antibody test does not give you magical armor. You have to assume you're still vulnerable. So get the test if you're curious. Get the test, especially if you wanna donate plasma, but don't get the test because you think it's some sort of get out of jail free, free card. That's not how it works. Great, thank you. By the way, one yeah. more thing. If you wanna give the test, one of the five free city locations in New York is right in West Harlem. Very proud of that, it's in our district. It's at 21 Old Broadway, right off 125th Street in Broadway. And uh, it's free. You have to sign up for an appointment online, but um, if, if you'd like to get this test, 
that's a great place to do it. Well, that's perfect because it, it segues way with another audience question. They ask, what do we do if we go to a testing facility and they ask for payment? Aren't the tests free? Okay, so the council member, okay. Well, I'll, I'll very briefly then I'll pass it on to you, Doc. Um, almost all of the sites where you can get a, a diagnostic test, remember there's two kinds, and so I talked about the first kind to tell you if you have the virus right now, almost all of them are going to be free. Meaning if you have insurance, there'll be no copay. And if you don't have insurance, they won't charge you. That, by the way, is true at CityMD. And there are, I think, about 125 or more CityMD sites which are offering this. Again, including one in West Harlem at uh, 146 and Broadway. Um, now, the antibody test is a different story. And I think most places will charge you. However, those five city sites um, are places you can get the antibody test for free. And again, we have one right in the heart of West Harlem. So there's really no need to pay for either an antibody or diagnostic test. Great. Yes. And if I, if I can, um, if sure. I can just add in, we've been talking about the antibody test. Absolutely. Of course, uh, you know, the council members ready to join the Department of Health. I, I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Uh, <laughs> Um, but the important and the important test that the health department recently changed our recommendations is in the diagnostic test. We recommend that all New Yorkers get the diagnostic test. We could not make that recommendation before because as people who were watching the news know, uh, the tremendous disorganization and lack of leadership at the federal level made the entire testing process uh, in the beginning um, unnecessarily difficult for people in the United States. Uh, other countries managed to do it pretty well, but we did not. We're past that time period. We now have testing availability for the diagnostic test uh, for any New Yorker free. There are sites everywhere. You can go to the website or call 311 at the website. I just tried it before this meeting. You type in your address, you get a map. I got like the seven or eight places that are near me. Uh, in my area of the Bronx, it's pretty easy. If you don't like computers, you can use the phone. And we want all New Yorkers to get a diagnostic test because we are trying to find, at this point in the pandemic, we are trying to find every single positive case in this city. Why? So that we can work with that person, get them to be separated from somebody they might affect, infect. Nobody wants to infect other people. I, I don't think anybody wants to do that. And then we can take their contacts and again, ask them also to separate for two weeks. And if we can do that successfully, find every single Wingle positive case and get that person and their contacts to be separated just for a short time, no three months here, just 10 to 14 days. So that's gonna feel like nothing to us by this time. That is the way that the other people who are diagnostic test negative can go about what they need to do and do it a little bit more freely. So that's the phase we're entering into. I urge people, and that's something we're asking community organizations to tweet about, to put it out on their platforms, go get a test, go get a diagnostic test. As the council member said, the antibody test is, is not something that we're emphasizing at this phase in the pandemic. This is not gonna help us do what we need to do, find everyone who could be infective, take them out of you know, circulation for a little bit of time, like we've all been doing for three months, so that we can let everybody else go about their business a little bit more freely. Super important. Thanks. Thank you, Doctor. Um, so in light of um, in the interest of time and uh, segueing to the second panel on, on policing in New York City, I have one last question for all three panelists. Um, in light of the protests over George Floyd's death, um, I have this question for Jane as a doctor, Mark as a public servant, and Laura as an attorney. Um, your thoughts on this. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, and the American College of Physicians have called racism a public health issue. We know its victims, we know the victims of racism, but can you tell us what your thoughts are on where this disease comes from? And anyone can begin. Council member, want to start that one off? 
I mean, I'm happy to do it, but I. Well, you, you need know. a 400 year history lesson. And this has been uh, a, a virus that has infected the DNA of this country for four centuries now, a legacy we have not yet surpassed. It has infected every sector of American life from policing to healthcare to housing to employment to education. And we are long overdue for a reckoning <clears throat> of the ways that racism has become systemic in those sectors. And this is a panel on healthcare. Healthcare is not immune, not only because of the disproportionate rates in which people are uninsured in this country, where black and brown Americans are far more likely to live life without the benefit of health insurance, but because medical institutions themselves have documented levels of racism, treating patients differently uh, because of the color of their skin. We are not going to overcome these injustices unless we name and directly confront the racism which continues to affect this society. And I am grateful that we're having these kinds of conversations more now than ever before. The conversations aren't enough. We need policy change. We need institutional change. And on that front, I'm just gonna mention one thing that's a segue to the next panel. We are hotly debating the next budget for New York City. We're debating it in the New York City Council. And just in the last 24 hours, we are, we are emerging with a proposal that could cut as much as $1 billion from the NYPD. That would create more funding for the kinds of social programs that we know ultimately are the key to making this a healthy and safer city. Investing in young people, investing in healthcare, investing in, in the environment, and stay tuned on this, guys, because we're two weeks away from passing New York City's budget, and I think we have the chance for a game change in a cut to policing that could offer desperately needed resources for the other areas that I mentioned that could really make this a safer and healthier city. Um, so I, I wanna thank you again for inviting me to this panel and uh, thank you again for everything that you, the WEAC community are doing to advance just justice in healthcare and policing and the environment at this difficult time. Thank you. Yeah, hard, hard to follow that. I'm gonna follow it if it's okay with, with a, um, with some additional thoughts. So sure. why do we have racism? Why? Why do we have it? What is the underpinning? Yes, a 400 year lesson. That is absolutely true. Uh, but the counterpart to racism is to look at who's benefiting from racism. Uh, and so it's important from the health department's view uh, to also talk about white supremacy because there are people who are benefiting right now. There's a system out there and they like it that way. Uh, they are profiting from it. Uh, they are garnering power as a result of it. They are influencing what's going on. And certainly uh, you can look at the medical industry uh, and I will say industry there because it's an it's a, it's a economic force uh, that we have to examine very, very carefully to understand how it is that we as a society have created something that benefits certain people and absolutely by way of disadvantaging others. So um, this isn't a case of a couple of bad actors in this situation. These are interweaving systems and whether you get in there through an environmental lens or through a health lens uh, or through a criminal justice lens, these things are, are, are um, important systems that we have to begin to address. Funding is one of them, it's huge. People say that the values of a city are reflected in its city budget. So this is an important thing for all New Yorkers to keep track of uh, and to understand why it is that racism penetrates in everywhere. And I, I think it's inseparable from the other sectors um, of society and there are people who are benefiting from it. Uh, you know, as a white person, privilege, uh, absolutely. But we have to figure out the ways that it's also hurting all of us. Uh, it's certainly hurting all of us. So 
it, it is a 400 year history lesson and throw a little sociology and economics in there uh, as well. And the health department uh, committed itself about eight years ago under Dr. Mary Bassett to becoming an anti-racist organization. And it has been a difficult and fruitful struggle and we aren't there yet. And we, um, we wanna join with all New Yorkers in that struggle that we're in so that our city agency can reflect what we think are health promoting values, which is anti-racism. And I'd just like to, to add, you know, as the other speakers have said, this is a deep and entrenched problem. Um, it's enshrined in our laws going back to the beginning of our country and um, many of the laws that seem neutral on their face really have very disparate impacts on different communities, things like bank redlining and housing segregation. These issues go back a long, long way. I, I am encouraged though when I see the pr protests in the streets um, and people of all colors and races coming together. I hope those protests continue. I think without pressure we don't get change and um, you know the Attorney General has an investigation right now into the interactions between the New York City Police Department and the public during the recent protests because the right to peacefully, peacefully protest is one of our most basic rights. And so that investigation is gonna make sure that our citizens who wanna go out and have their voices heard can do so in a peaceful way and not suffer at the hands of the police. So I, I'm encouraged um, that that investigation will lead to some hopefully lasting results and that people can go out and have their voices be heard. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, uh, Mark Levine, Laura Levine, and Dr. Jane Bethel. Um, now I will open it up to the second panel. Uh, and I believe that presentation is being uploaded now. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony, for doing an awesome job with moderating. I think you did an amazing job with capturing the questions that a lot of our members want the answers to. And of course, I thank all of our panelists for providing such a wealth of information that is necessary for all of our members and Northern Manhattan residents um, to know um, here as a whole. Um, as we are thinking about opening up the city, um, we are also doing so in the extreme, um, during, the, during the time where we have extreme heat. And so thinking about asking people to stay in their home to protect against the spread of COVID-19 and then thinking about the conditions uh, that they have in their homes. So we actually do have a poll to ask everyone who is participating about how they're gonna be enduring uh, the summer during this pandemic as, as we are uh, continuing to be in this pandemic. Uh, so as we are preparing for the next panel conversation, Go ahead and launch a poll. Uh, Marquise, the poll questions are uh, not uh, uploaded. So we'll just, I'll be putting the question in the chat if everyone can look there and, and just answer in the chat. And Great. also, if I, if I can just say that we, we put a lot of links in the chat. I, I don't know whether you can, you can extract those and then get those out again, but whatever. Pe if people can go to the chat, we have, we have something on there about uh, best practices for protesting. We have a lot of information just linking just to the sheet on testing, what is good for, what is not good for, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's in the chat and link by link. Uh, they're coming from Anna Schatz, S-H-A-T-S. -S. So there's more information there because there's so much information I want to put out there um, and, and, and so little time and I appreciate the forum. So do look at the chat. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Doctor, so much for sharing all of that information. We are recording uh, this membership meeting um, and we will be sharing the comments, um, all of the comments that were placed in the comments section publicly. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, Sono, can you uh, step up and just sort of ask uh, the poll questions and, and, ask, and I ask folks uh, to share their response in the chat box? Yes, so I've just posted the two questions and, and just to follow up Dr. Vidal, we've, we've taken all of the links and are going to certainly send those out. 
So thank you. And thank you. Thanks. Anna. thanks. Great. Um, yeah. So the, I just put the two questions in the chat. Uh, the first question is we're wondering if anyone's received a call about the ACs uh, as New York City is released is giving away 74,000 free ACs to people over 60 years of age um, and have other qualifications. So we're wondering if anyone's received those phone calls, um, their robo calls. And we've, we're also wondering if the cooling centers are open in July, would you go? Would you feel comfortable going? So please feel free to just kind of put some of your answers in the chat. I'll keep putting them out. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sono, for that. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time to respond. I encourage you to repeat the question um, in response so that we can make sure that we are keeping track of everyone's response uh, to the appropriate question. Um, as we move forward, As we move forward, I am going to take us into uh, the next panel, and I would like to introduce um, our Deputy Director, as well as our Director of Policy Initiative, Cecil Corbin Mark. Hey, uh, thank you, Marquise. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I want to thank our, our previous panelists and also thank Anthony Carrion. Um, today, this <clears throat> panel that I am moderating is going to focus on the other part of a very critical conversation that's happening in our society today, and it's about the measures that are being taken around police reform. Um, we have the pleasure uh, of having a real conversation with uh, someone who uh, many people in this city know. Her name is Gwen Carr. Uh, Gwen should be joining us shortly. Um, and I will go ahead and just introduce Gwen Carr. Um, and then we may also be joined by a, uh, sorry, a Re Representative Adriano Espeyat. Um, and so let me go ahead and do their bios and introductions, and then we can jump right in. Um, it's our pleasure uh, to be able to have uh, an opportunity to chat with Gwen Carr. Sadly, Gwen is the mother of Eric Garner, and sadly, not sadly, she, he is the mother of Eric Garner, but sadly, she, she lost her son. Um, Eric, Eric and uh, Gwen are residents, or were, uh, our residents are of Staten Island. Cecil, I think we lost you. All right, Cecil, Cecil, you're on mute. Yeah, Cecil has been, oh, he's back now. All right, you're good. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, uh, sorry about that. Um, so I was saying that Gwen Carr is from Staten Island, and prior to her uh, becoming an activist around the issues of uh, police brutality, uh, she was a conductor and later a train operator for the MTA, where she worked for 22 years. Um, also uh, possibly joining us is Congressman Adriano Espeyat. Uh, Congressman Espeyat was sworn into office on January 3rd, 2017. Uh, he is our representative uh, for Northern Manhattan, and he was first elected to Congress in 2016, and he's currently serving his second term uh, he is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and the House Small Business Committee. Some of you will also remember uh, Congressman Espeyat uh, from his time as a New York State Senator representing portions of Upper Manhattan as well. So um, as uh, those folks join, we will uh, bring them into the room for the conversation. I am going to uh, start out by just giving people a bit of an overview of the uh, couple of uh, 
policy actions that took place um, uh, in terms of police practices reform that are, are now uh, part of uh, our city uh, and state experience. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Um, let's do. Um, um, can you see it now? No. Um, okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see. Okay. There we go. Can you see it now? It's coming. It's going to come through, Cecil, but it's not yet here. Oh, dear. Okay. Um, well, it's loading. in the interest of time, it's, it's loading. coming. It's loading, yes. Okay. All right. There we go. Um, so, are, is everybody able to see it now? Can you see it, Marquis? No. It's still no, loading on um, the screen. Yeah. It's uh, still, do you want me to pull up? Is this your PowerPoint? Do you want me to pull it up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you can, that would be because maybe it's not. Right. It's here. There it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so, just in terms of policing uh, practices reform that's happening in the state, can you hear me, Marquise? Yes, we can hear you, but we lost your presentation. So I'm going to try to pull it up on my end. Uh, continue, continue the talk. I will get the presentation up on my end. Uh, did we lose him? I think Cecil is having technical issues. Yeah, we see that. Um, unmute him. Yeah, he is having some technical issues. We don't have a screen. Can you um, hear me now? Yeah, we got you now, Cecil. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to have to uh, see if that... Uh, can you see the presentation as well, Charles? No, we cannot. So the suggestion that we put on the floor is that you keep on moving, and Marquise is going to be working on getting up the screen. Okay. Um, I will do that. Um, so many of you would have seen in the news that the House of Representatives introduced a, a set of police reforms. Uh, it is a bill that is currently uh, gathering additional votes on the floor. Um, the House of Representatives is supposed to come back to vote on this bill, and that's one of the things that we wanted to talk to um, Congress member Asayak about. Underneath the provisions in the bill, the House of Representatives Police Reform Bill would revise federal law on criminal police misconduct and qualified immunity reform. So some people should be aware that uh, police currently are shielded uh, from prosecution at this particular point under an immunity provision that essentially allows them to uh, avoid prosecution. Uh, prosecutors, in order to charge them, would have to really demonstrate that um, police officers exhibited some willful intent to hurt, harm, or kill uh, uh, someone who they took into custody. And that has been a significant barrier over the years to bringing prosecution against police officers who kill uh, people who they take into custody. The other uh, element of the House of Representatives bill that would be introduced uh, is a ban on no-knock warrants in drug cases at the federal level. So some people may have heard in the news that uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, who is a 26-year-old EMT, uh, had the police barge into her house under a no-knock warrant um, after using a battering ram to enter her home. Police uh, then uh, were fired upon by her boyfriend, and they returned fire, killing her. 
that use of the no-knock warrant uh, would be banned under this particular uh, bill at the House of Representatives as well. The bill would ban chokeholds at the federal level. Uh, in 2014, Eric Garner was killed by New York police who used the chokehold to restrain him during an arrest. And in May, uh, Judge Floyd died after police officers placed, his, placed their knee, uh, placed a knee on his neck uh, for more than eight minutes. The legislation would put a federal ban in place on the use of police chokeholds, um, which is defined in the bill and putting pressure on an individual's throat as in type that impedes their ability to breathe. The bill would also establish a national registry of misconduct by law enforcement officers. Currently, you cannot get data on police misconduct, and that makes it difficult to really uh, figure out who past offenders are and ensure that they don't move on to other places to get new jobs. The bill would also require states to report a use of force uh, to the Justice Department. And uh, again, here little is known about the frequency with which police officers currently use force, and that uh, would be changed under this law. It would mandate racial bias training at the federal level, uh, a reform that's been implemented in some police stations across the country. Uh, racial bias training is aimed at getting law enforcement officers to recognize their own explicit and implicit biases and how these attitudes affect the way they respond in different situations. Um, it would require that deadly force only be used as a last resort. Uh, it would make lynching a federal crime. And it would require police to use more body and dashboard cameras. And then lastly, the bill would uh, limit the transfer of military equipment to local police departments. Um, currently, military, the military is able to distribute excess equipment, including armored vehicles and ammunition, to local law enforcement agencies, and this bill would prohibit the distribution of equipment like drones and armored vehicles. So those are the provisions within the new bill that is on the House of Representatives, um, and that bill has yet to be voted on. It does have 200 co-sponsors at this time, and then they need to get to more than 218, um, and uh, they're working on that at this moment. In New York State, uh, you would have also heard uh, recently in the news that Governor Cuomo uh, signed into law what they call the New York Say Their Name Reform Agenda. Um, that law or suite of laws, actually, would repeal the 50A uh, section, which essentially makes it uh, uh, not possible to get personnel records of police officers, firefighters, et cetera. So you cannot track in the state uh, bad behavior or conduct um, that is attributed underneath their uh, personnel records. Um, this uh, New York State set of laws would also ban chokeholds. Um, we should note that chokeholds were banned by the New York City Police in 1993, yet they were still being used, and it is the way in which Eric Garner lost his life uh, by Officer Daniel Pantaleo. Um, the New York State Say Their Name reform agenda would also include prohibiting race-based 911 calls. Uh, people may remember what happened when uh, a gentleman was birding in Central Park, an uh, African-American gentleman, and he was uh, uh, asking a white woman to please put her dog on a leash, and she then called 911, um, even though she was clearly violating the park rules by not having her dog on a leash in that area. Um, and then finally, the New York State uh, State and Name Reform Agenda would designate the Attorney General as an independent prosecutor for matters relating to civilian deaths. So those are the elements of uh, the two big reform packages that are impacting us here in New York State. And I will stop there and see whether or not um, we are joined by Gwen Carr. We are. Yes, we have we, um, on the phone. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Ms. Carr, it is an absolute pleasure um, to have you join with us. I uh, want to first express uh, directly from the WEAC staff board and all of our members our, our deepest sympathy for the loss of your son. 
Um, it was a terrible and tragic incident that I think left not only New Yorkers um, taken aback, but also many people across the country. I know that uh, you have launched your activism as a result of that. And I wanted to just begin our conversation by just asking, tell us about that event. Remind us of uh, some of the things that took place and how you came to understand what had happened to you. Well, back uh, on July 17, 2014, um, I learned that my son was murdered because I had gotten a couple of phone calls. And the first phone call just told me that something had happened to my son, but they didn't know what. They had just gotten a phone call themselves. The next phone call, the person had the same exact information. So this made me very anxious. So I wanted to get to my son to find out exactly what happened because they told me he had some kind of interaction with the police. I called my husband. I asked him if he could go to Staten Island because I knew he was in Brooklyn and see what's going on with Eric because I was on the train. I, I was a train operator in New York City at the time and I was all the way up in Queens. So he says, okay. Then I thought about it. I says, no, just wait for me to get to the other end and we'll both go and see what happened to Eric. Well, when I got to the other end, he was waiting for me put me in the car and I kept asking him, did he hear anything? Um, did you get any calls? And he was trying to keep it from me because he had already known what had happened. And he was just telling me, get in the seat belt. We're on our way to Staten Island. I got in my seat belt. And then as I kept questioning him over and over again, he had to just break down and tell me that Eric had been murdered by the NYPD. Uh -uh. And at that point, I think I almost lost my mind. Mm. I was trying to get out the seatbelt. I was trying to get out the door. He had to put the child lock on to keep me from getting out the car because I felt like I could run to Staten Island faster than I could get there by that car. Uh -huh. And he tried to calm me down and get me across that bridge. And when we got there, and I was just so out of it. They wouldn't let me go to the hospital because I was in such a bad state. But I got upstairs and I didn't know what to do. I was crying. I was yelling. I didn't know what had happened. All I knew that my son wasn't with me anymore. So that was one of the worst days of my life. Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. the, the worst day of my life was taking him to the cemetery and knowing he wasn't going to come back home with me. And that yeah. was very traumatic. Yes, I can absolutely imagine. Um, I wanted to uh, pick up on, uh, I just ran down for the audience some of the elements of both the House of Representatives policing reform bill and then the uh, New York State Say Their Names reform agenda. I know that your activism since your son's death has really been focused on making sure that uh, we do something in the way of policy change. And so given some of the things that have been put forth by the House of Representatives, obviously not a law yet, and what has been signed by the governor, I wanted to get your reaction to uh, some of the elements of that. What do you think about it? What do you think might be missing? And where do we still have to go? Well, I appreciate very much uh, the people who got behind me to get these bills into motion so that they could get signed. And uh, I give my gratitude to all. And I want to thank the governor for signing the Eric Garner um, Choco bill and the STAT Act, the 50A, um, the right to know, all of those is a step in the right direction. Because before we had no type of legislation on that. The Choco Bill was policy, which no one followed. I wouldn't say no one, but those bad police officers didn't follow. They would put, you know, citizens into a chokehold and thought nothing of it. 
But then the day came when they put my son in a chokehold and they murdered him on video where the whole world seen my son saying, I can't breathe 11 times. And they didn't decide to let him live. They killed him that day. But what they didn't know, they killed the wrong mother's son that day because I was gonna be after them and I wasn't gonna let up. And even with these bills signed, I'm still not letting up. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's anything else that needs to be done? Um, are you satisfied with uh, the suite of things? Yes, we, we want to thank uh, you for your activism, um, and we thank the governor for signing these things. But is there anything missing? What else should we be holding our elected officials accountable for in terms of change in policy here? Well, even though these bills are in law, now we must make sure that the police stand accountable when these actions take place. Uh, the law is no good if it doesn't work. So we have to hold their feet. We must hold the elective officials' feet to the fire to enforce these new laws. Because um, so many times we get laws passed and they are ignored. Mm, indeed, indeed. And you're, I, I want to just pick up on the fact that you said we've got to hold the elected official feet to the fire. And I want to make a, a, a shout out and a plug to the audience that June 23rd is primary voting in New York City. If you haven't, uh, you can continue to receive uh, an absentee uh, ballot. You can request it under the COVID-19 provision. And you can have that actually postmarked right up until June 23rd. Um, how, how about, uh, Ms. Carr, uh, the House of Representatives bill? Is there anything there that you think is missing? Um, and what would you say to representatives like Adriano Espaillat uh, that, that needs to be done further to help advance that to a place where we have the right policies? Well, um, what I would say to them, even though we have these bills that was passed, we have to improve upon them. But just by having something on the books, that's a step in the right direction. But um, they're telling us with the chokehold bill uh, that it would be a last result for you to use the chokehold and it would have to be if it was your life or theirs. Now, how are we going to prove that? It has to be more clear of how we're going to use um, that. Because you know, the police officers always say that they feared for their life. In every, in every instance, everything makes them fear for their life. Looking at a black man walking down the street, they fear for their life. So we got to mm -hmm. define that more explic uh, explicitly. Can you also tell our audience um, obviously, it took five years before uh, anything happened in the way of uh, uh, Officer Daniel Pantaleo. But can you tell us what has happened to the other officers who have been involved, uh, who were involved in the case with Eric Garner? Well, nothing happened to the other officers. And actually, five years ago is when the Department of Justice took up the case and said that they would. Uh, look under every rock, every stone, and then they would give us a decision. Then five years to the date, they dropped the ball and said that they weren't going any further. I was very, very angry at that, at that meeting. Because in fact, to add insult to injury, the whole world knew about it before we did. So mm -hmm. I had to tell them, well, maybe you're not going any further, but I am. And that's how we got the departmental trial, where we went to the uh, CCRB. And that's the only reason that Daniel Pantaleo got fired, because I pushed on for the trial. And before the trial, they tried, to, the, the PBA tried to um, dismiss the whole case, try to get the judge to dismiss the whole case, but she didn't. And I'm so proud of her for that. And I'm proud of the commissioner at the time 
who made the right decision and fired at least one of those cops. Those other police officers, they still need to stand accountable. And I'm going to still be fighting for that. You've mentioned both the CCRB, so I just want to make sure that all of our listeners know, um, viewers and listeners know that the CCRB is the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and it is a part of the policing infrastructure to try to create some level of accountability over the actions of the police. And uh, you also mentioned the PBA. Uh, the PBA is the Police Benevolence Association, and it says it calls itself a union. Um, but in, in many respects, it is really one of the things that has stood in the way, wouldn't you say, Ms. Carr, of actual reforms to the policing system in our, our city and our state. Yes, yes. Because those P the PBA lawyers, they will try every trick in the book. They will try to downplay the incident as much as they can. They even said my son caused his own death so many crazy things they said at the meeting, at the uh, trial. I'm gonna turn and see if we have any questions from our audience. Uh, we're getting close to time and uh, I wanted to make sure um, that we had an opportunity if people uh, had any questions. So if you have any questions for Ms. Carr, um, you can put them in the chat um, and we will take them on. Um, I'm looking to see if I can see any, but I do not see any. I see a lot of support for you in the chat, Ms. Carr, uh, saying don't stop going after them. Keep it up. Thank you for sharing your story and your experience. Um, thank you, Gwen Carr. Be blessed and comforted. What organizations are you working with to try to bring more changes to the town? That's the question. What was that? What organization? What organizations are you working with to try to bring more changes to police brutality? Well, I work with several organizations. Um, as you know, when this tragedy first happened with me, I started with NAN uh, immediately. I also work with the Justice Committee. I've worked with the um, Arc of Justice. I've worked with CPR. I've worked with quite a few agencies. Uh, this is how you know I do. I go and get as much information as I can. I put it together. We go to Albany. We voice our concerns. We lobby with the politicians and uh, try to get laws passed. And this is how it came about me getting uh, my name on a lot of those bills so that I could get these laws passed. Okay. Um, someone wants to know how, uh, uh, someone wants to know what uh, should uh, Biden do if he is elected? First of all, Biden has to come in and he has to reestablish some of these laws that President Trump has put into practice that is against us as black and browns and not only against black and browns against people as a nation so he has to come and undo a lot of this obstruction that trump has put into place so specifically one of the things that the trump administration did was the justice department stopped the actual review uh, this, of this, police this departments thing, right Ms. This, Carr? This, this, the, 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 uh, what is it, the dissent to decree, decree, to, how do you say that? The consent decree, the consent the decree, decree process. Right? Now yes, that indeed. needs to put back in place right away. Okay. Um, someone wants to know uh, how, uh, what can they do to help you in your fight? Well, to help me in my fight, um, I have an organization called the Gone Away Foundation and you can find it on goneaway.org. And um, you can go to my website and you can see what we're doing. Um, if you like to donate to help the cause, because we help other people, we help mothers. We, I go around the country and I speak to schools, I speak to the youth. And um, another thing they can do, they can vote. I would love for everyone in my listening area to vote. And a lot of people do not know there is a very good website 
It's called vote.org, B-O-T-E dot org. It will give you all the information you need. It will tell you how to early vote, where to early vote, if you want to go to the polls, if you want to vote by mail or by uh, computer. And it gives you addresses and everything. It, and I tried it out and it's excellent. So vote.org, tell everyone to go to that site. I will, and I put it in the chat for all of our listeners and viewers. So first off, the Garner Foundation at www.garnerway.org, and then uh, vote.org as well. That's right. So they're in the chat for people. Well, Ms. Carr, thank you so much. I also wanted to just end on one note, which is, um, uh, oh, there's one last question here. I'll try to guess the, grab this in as well. Do you believe dismantling police is a reality in such a major city like New York City? Do I believe that dismantling the police can be a reality in such a major city like New York? Well, if it's dismantled, it's not going to be dismantled immediately. We got to have something else in place when we dismantle. We can't just take it away because we need the police at certain, you know, at certain times. But we can talk about it. We can have discussions about how we can, you know, change the mentality. And because, see, the police was put here in the beginning to catch slave runaways. So as we progress, as they said, that mentality stayed with some of the police officers. So we have to um, really talk and have a conversation about that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I wanted to end on a note. Um, our organization, We Act for Environmental Justice, is deeply grateful. You uh, talking to many of our members here. We have over 120 something people here for you today. Um, we thank you for your fight and the work that you've been doing. Um, we also want to say that we stand in solidarity with uh, the uh, work that you have been doing. We think that justice movements at this time in particular and at all times really need to stand together and come together. And sometimes people may say, I know sometimes when I show up in sort of police brutality circles, um, people will say, well, what does environmental justice have to do with this? And uh -huh. I respond to them that all fights for justice are the same fight, right? They're fights to end racism. And if we are not standing together, then we will definitely keep falling apart. Um, and, then, and then the other thing that I say to people is that uh, it's, also about what's happening in our prisons. Our prisons are being overrun by COVID-19 uh, all across this country. They're being treated uh -huh. as though they're not human. The idea that how hot is a prison in a hot season, right? The idea that um, what are the conditions of lead inside of those prisons? What are the conditions of mold inside of those prisons? All of the issues that we work on in terms of protecting both the environment and the public health are so uh, applicable to those who are in, uh, who are in confined uh, quarters. So we stand with you. We thank you for everything that you've been doing. And thank you for making time to be with us today. I know you have a very busy schedule. Uh, yes, um, I do, and but thank you for having me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so we, we are uh, coming to the end here. We have a few closing notes uh, to uh, get uh, uh, for our members, who, things we want to share with you. Um, I do have one last thing that I want to note, and that is the Public Service Commission um, uh, passed a, uh, approved a petition that New York City was actually uh, filing on behalf of more than 400,000 uh, low income, low to moderate income residents in New York City requesting relief because of COVID-19 uh, for people's electricity bills. And uh, we have, uh, we're happy to announce that it's been successful. The Public Service Commission, New York State Public Service Commission did provide $70 million in aid for approximately 440,000 families in New York City providing up to $140 of rebates on bills
from June to October uh, for low-income New Yorkers. Uh, we have filed a memorandum of support to that petition and Let's working in coordination with the just came now and I'm without breath. So if you could walk me to the corner, because I'm, I'm right now. Okay. I'm in. okay. Um, and so we just wanted to inform folks that that was a victory. Um, we are grateful to the mayor's office. Uh, we're grateful to the governor's office where we uh, uh, advocated for this petition to be supported. And so uh, folks should be able to see on their bills if they are in the low income category with Con Edison registered uh, rebates on their bills between June and October. So I wanted to say that. I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Sono, who's going to close us out. Sono? Actually, th thank you, Cecil. Um, before we close out, uh, I do want to take the time to thank all of you, our members and participants, for taking time on a Saturday to join us in this June membership meeting. It's been such a pleasure to be with each and every one of you um, and engage in this conversation. I also want to thank our speakers. We were able to have an engaging and informative conversation because you joined us and, and, and lend us your expertise. So thank you so much for being with us on a Saturday uh, to share in this um, very important yet difficult conversation. I also want to thank our moderators, um, Cecil and Anthony, who did a phenomenal job today. So please give them a round of applause. Um, this, <laughs> thank you. I hope Chris, you got a shot of those, those round of applause. Um, I also want to thank the membership planning committee. Every Friday, there is a group of we act dedicated members who come together to plan these membership um, meetings. And I just want to recognize and say thank you to all of them who, who spend every Friday night with me putting uh, this meeting together. I also want to thank all of uh, my co-workers, the organizing team who I'm constantly throwing different ideas and they're like, you know what, you're too much. Just keep it simple. Um, but really love the organizing team for the support that they provide. And the same for the rest of my coworkers um, who are here today, who are also working on that chat box and answering all the questions that you have. So again, thank you all. And I ask that you stay just for a couple of minutes so that we can let you know what's coming down the pipeline. It was great being with you. Sono, please take us out. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for uh, coming to the meeting. We're so happy to have you all. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of information, some forecasting of what's coming in our July membership meeting. We're having a big meeting about extreme heat, about the summertime, how it's affecting our health, how we can make some changes in northern Manhattan. It's going to be a great, great meeting. And to kind of start us off with that conversation, I just want to share some important information that we think that everyone should know now. Um, with the AC program that we mentioned, um, just to kind of stay alert, if anyone receives those calls, we understand if you don't want to answer on uh, calls that you don't know. So you can let it go to voicemail and then but listen to the voicemail. And if it says they're calling about the free AC, then you know you might want to want to call them back. Um, but there's another way to get an AC and a fan um, if you're income qualified and it's called the low income home energy assistance program people call it LIHEAP. Um, it's money from the state that they give people that are income qualified to receive a free ac unit or a fan um, in their homes and the applications opened in the beginning of may and they're rolling so the sooner you apply the more likely you are to get the ac so we encourage everyone to apply as quickly as they can um, also, because, you know, as we feel this is already hot, our homes are already hot, and we want to make sure that everyone's safe in their homes. So I'm just going to quickly show you the application. This is where you can go online. This is uh, nyc.gov. We'll also send out the link. Um, and this just has some really, uh, you know, easy to, to access information about applying for 
what is called the Home Energy Assistance Program HEAP. Here, it gives an overview of how it works. And then if you click on the second tab here, it shows your eligibility. And here are some of the big eligibility guidelines. Um, you know, if you have children, if you're over 60 years old, if you have a permanent disability, um, you do have to be a US, U.S. citizen for this program. I'll add you don't for the free ACs that you might be getting calls for. And then the other big uh, qualifier is your income. So here there's a, there's a pretty good chart that shows how much your income is based on the amount of people that are living in your home that you can see if you qualify. So if you do qualify, you can go through and click this next piece that says what you need to include. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of information. I'm not going to lie. It is not a simple enrollment process. I'll say that's something that we act as thinking about how we can advocate to get this to be an easier process in the long term. But this is what we have now. Um, so here's a list of a lot of different things they might ask for. And then lastly, how to apply, most importantly, now you can apply by mail. You can download this form. You click download the form. You fill it out. You get all the paperwork together and you send it to this, this um, address here. Uh, you can also apply by phone. Apply by in-person is not happening right now. So here, 212-331-3126 is another phone number you can call. They, this phone number is open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. You can also call 311. If you just don't remember exactly what the program is, you don't remember exactly how to find the website, if you don't remember exactly how to do the application process, if you maybe need assistance with the application process, you can always just say call 311 and they will guide you. Um, la the next thing we want to just quickly shout out is, uh, sorry is to take the census. The census is still open. This is very important, especially for our neighborhoods, that it gives us our money for, you know, a very long time. And it directs money from the U.S. government to our communities based on who's living here. So it's really important that you all respond. Again, you do not need to be a citizen to respond to this. Anybody can fill this out. One person can fill this out in the household. So go to 2020census.gov. I'll also reiterate uh, Cecil shout out and Gwen Carr's shout out, please vote. The primaries of June 23rd, where all, a lot of us can do mail-in ballots. Anyone can qualify for mail-in ballots due to COVID. You can just check that off, that that's why you're asking for one. Um, you should receive a, a opportunity to apply for a mail-in ballot in your mailbox, but you can also go online and fill that out as well. Lastly, uh, please uh, don't forget to go to weact.org slash coronavirus. For any information about coronavirus, we have uh, resource guides. We have one in Spanish. We also have here all the different testing sites that are available uptown. This also includes the antibody testing site that Council Member Levine mentioned, and you can go to make an online appointment or call to make an appointment for a lot of these sites. So please use this as a space for you to, to um, use and, and get information about coronavirus. Um, and then lastly, I just want to uh, kick it off to Gwen to quickly make one announcement. And then after that, we, we will end our call. And, and I thank you all so much for coming. We we're happy to have you. We thought this was a wonderful conversation and um, happy Pride Month. Um, and thank you all. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I just want to quickly share that in 1970, former Mayor Koch designated June 26th as Women in Jazz Day. So in the next couple of weeks, we, myself, Incorporation of Artists on the Move and Arts and Jazz Fest, New York City, International Women in Jazz. We are all going to be doing something to celebrate women in jazz. The day was designated um, in celebration of our wonderful Kobe Narita, who was married to um, Paul Ash of Sam Ash. And she has just been a phenomenal woman celebrating jazz music. So we have to do more to bring this back 
to the attention of the public, this was actually a proclamation that former Mayor Koch um, presented June 26th, Women in Jazz Day, and we will be presenting on Facebook. And we will keep we, um, uh, we Act informed of what we will be doing. Don't Thank you so it. much. Don't forget it. Thank you all so much. I have one last final thank you to share as we are going off to the rest of our weekend. Um, you may have heard him in those outreach calls and reminder calls to get you to come to this membership meeting. This man has made more than 400 calls to get over 102 people here to this meeting. I would be remiss if I didn't shout out my brother in the movement and the master outreacher, uh, Russell Taylor. Thank you so much for all the work that you do for We Act. Yes, Russell. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you, Marquise. You're wonderful.